In this video, I'd like to go over some practical RF hardware and PCB design tips. In particular, we'll be looking at a real-world embedded systems design, which includes a GPS module as well as an active antenna. The board you're seeing here was developed by me and Open Seneca, and I will be going into more detail about the various subsystems of this board in the future video. But for now, we'll be focusing on the RF part and what we need to pay attention to when designing these boards. Before we get started, this board was actually produced by JLC PCB, who are also sponsoring this video. It's really cool to see that the JLC PCB SMT parts library now actually features connectors, which we also use on this board. So you can find things such as uh, HDMI connectors or USB connectors, various types of wire to board connectors and so forth. So that's a really cool addition and something I'll be showing in future videos as well. But let's get back to the RF tips. Here are the topics I'd like to go through in brief detail in this video. Firstly, I'd like to talk about when we actually need to consider these RF design techniques and when we need to apply them. And this is often referred to as some sort of critical length. So how long do our sections or our traces need to be for the RF effects to actually take place and to matter? Secondly, I'd like to talk about PCB stack up, two and four layer PCBs or even beyond, and what we need to pay attention to. Thirdly, I'd like to show you how to calculate controlled impedance traces, typically something like 50 ohms or 75 ohms, the different types, micro strip and strip line. Then the fourth point is the pad to trace or trace to pad parameters. So for example, when you go to a very, from a very wide pad, for example, from an RF connector into a controlled impedance trace, which typically, for example, for a four layer board, we much skinnier. Do we need to take these effects into account and what can we do to mitigate them? Then as usual, clearance is very important, also in RF design, of course, and we want to try and keep that separate from other, for example, analog or digital sections. And lastly, I'd like to briefly show you how we calculate values for an antenna bias T. So for an active antenna, we have to supply DC power to the antenna while it's not disturbing the RF part into the receiver. Our first point is the critical length. And this is essentially telling us when do we need to take RF effects into account and when do we get phase changes across a section of our PCB. Essentially, if traces are longer than a fraction of the wavelength of the signal of interest. So for example, for GPS, typical consumer L1 band, which is about 1.6 gigahertz, the wavelength is 19 centimeters. So if the traces are longer than a fraction of that wavelength, we need to start paying attention to RF effects and we need to take extra care. This is often termed as a, for example, distributed element. The question now is, what is that fraction of the wavelength? This is how we calculate the critical lengths. And you can see there's two formula here. First of all, we have the strip line. And a strip line essentially means you have an internal trace where above and below we have a reference plane. A micro strip is essentially a trace on an outer layer where you have on the next layer underneath a reference plane. Now you can see here the formula is actually pretty similar. The critical length is the speed of light divided by the frequency of interest times one over the square root of epsilon r. Epsilon r is the relative permittivity of the dielectric. So for FR4, this will be something like 4.5 or 4.6. And then we divide that whole number we have here by 12. And this is then the fraction of that wavelength, essentially. For microstrip, it's slightly more complicated. We essentially have the same equation, except that the dielectric constant here is called EF, or rather, uh, the effective dielectric constant. And this is because below we have essentially the dielectric of the PCB and above we have essentially air. So it'll be a combination of those two dielectrics. And there's calculators online that shows you how to calculate this. But typically this value will be lower than just the dielectric constant of the PCB material. So here I've done an example calculation for the GPS L1 band. Now the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. The frequency of the GPS L1 band is centered at about 1.575 gigahertz. And then I've used a calculator, which I'll show you in just a second, to calculate the effective dielectric constant of this PCB. Then for a micro strip uh, trace, we can then figure out the critical length. And this turns out to be just 8.6 millimeters. So just under a centimeter, and we really need to pay attention to these RF effects. So this is something that is really good to know and really easy to calculate. If you just Google effective dielectric constant calculator, you'll see a lot of pages where you can actually calculate this effective dielectric constant. One of them is the first one here, uh, passenac.com. And we want to calculate the effective dielectric constant. We need to know the dielectric constant of the PCB. 
we needed to know the approximate width of our trace and the height between the trace and the next reference plane. So the dielectric constant is easy. We can just get that from our preferred um, PCB manufacturer, a GLC. For this certain stack up, it's 4.6. Um, the height between the trace and the reference plane is easy as well. You can see here for a four layer board between the top layer and the first inner layer, which is typically ground, it's 0 0.2 millimeters. The next thing is the actual width of the trace. And essentially you would need to calculate the correct impedance of the trace if you want a 50 ohm line, for example, and then put that width in here. I already know it's about 0 0.3 millimeters to get a 50 ohm line, so that's why I put that in here. But I'll show you later how to actually calculate uh, what you would need to do for a width for a 50 ohm line or 75 ohm line and so on. But essentially you plug these numbers in and this down here then tells you the effective dielectric constant, which is about 3.4. And that's what I used in the previous calculations. So here we are in KiCad, and this is the open Seneca board. And I'm gonna show you this RF section over here. Effectively, we have a UFL antenna connector. We have some sort of biasing network for the active antenna and that, that then feeds into this GPS module. Now the critical length was about 8.6 millimeters. So let's measure how long I kept this RF section. So I go from the UFL connector all the way into the pad. And you can see that's about 7.6 millimeters, which is below the critical length. So here are the takeaways when we've talked about critical lengths. Before you start routing, make sure you calculate the critical length in your design. This will depend on your PCB stack up, the frequency of interest, if it's analog or digital and so on. Remember to keep RF sections and traces as short as possible to make sure that you don't get into this critical length domain if you can help it. Now let's look at stack ups for RF boards. And we'll look at two of the most common scenarios. The first one is a two layer board. And this is a very, very common scenario for RF boards or pure RF boards. The reason being that we essentially have one layer to route our signals on and the next layer is then our reference plane, which will be ground typically. For two layer board, for like a 1.6 millimeter board, there's gonna be a large height between the trace and that reference plane. This means in turn that for a 50 ohm line would generally need to have wider controlled impedance traces. Wider control impedance traces means there's gonna be a better tolerance for manufacturing. And also the trace width variations will have less of an effect on trace impedance. If you contrast that to having very thin controlled impedance traces and then having the same manufacturing tolerances for those very skinny traces. The alternative is to have a four layer board or a multi-layer board above four layers. And four layer boards are very, very common in sort of mixed signal or embedded system boards, which you see a lot, where you might have a microcontroller, some various sensors, and maybe a small RF section. The difference to a two layer board here is that there's a very small height or much smaller height between the trace and the reference plane, which means also your RF traces, your controlled impedance traces will be narrower as well. Typically, we'll probably be using micro strip lines instead of strip line because the internal layers for a four layer board will be reserved for a ground plane as well as sort of the power routing. The nice thing with the four layers, of course, we have more routing layers, for example, the bottom layer as well. Also, in most embedded system boards, the RF part is typically only a small section. So for the Open Seneca design, because it's a typical embedded systems board, I chose to use four layers and that's more than sufficient. You can see I have the RF section over here, an MC over here and various different modules and sensors scattered around. I have a routing on the top and I have routing on the bottom. And internally, I have a, a ground plane also underneath the RF section. And then I also have some sort of power distribution on another plane. Now let's look at controlled impedance traces. And in particular, we're gonna look at two specific cases. One of them is the microstrip line where we have a trace on an outer layer. Then we have a dielectric medium and then we have some sort of reference plane on an internal layer or the second layer of a two layer board. This is termed microstrip. The other common case is a symmetric strip line where we have the trace now on an internal layer and above and below on adjacent layers, we then have reference planes. For a typical embedded systems board or four layer board, we will most likely go with a microstrip. A strip line has uh, several advantages over the microstrip. It depends on the use case. But I'd like to show you how to calculate a 50 ohm line or any impedance line with a four microstrip. To be able to calculate uh, the required trace width for a certain trace impedance, you need to know the stack up of your PCB you're using. And this is typically given on the PCB manufacturer's website. So for example, for JLC PCB, you can click on um, the controlled impedance PCB layer stack up in the capabilities section. So if I open that up, I'm using a four layer board of 1.6 millimeter thickness, and here it is. 
This stack up consists of this. So we have a top layer of a certain thickness, we have a prepreg in the middle, then a second layer and so on. And this is the information, information we then use in combination with a impedance calculator to give us the required trace width. So one way of calculating the trace width is going to KiCad and then click on this PCB calculator over here. So let me just open that. Then we want to click on transmission line and here we have to fill in all of our parameters. So now I've put on the left side here the stack up of the PCB from jlcpcb.com and on the right side we have the KiCad controlled impedance calculator. I've selected microstrip as my line type and you can see here a diagram of the relevant dimensions. First of all, we need to copy over the relative uh, permittivity of the dielectric, and that is 4.6. The next important dimension is the height between the trace and the reference plane below. And it turns out this is 0.2 millimeters, and I've put that in here over as well. We also need to know the thickness of the trace, and for typical one ounce per square foot copper, that'll be 35 microns or 0.035 millimeters, and that's what I've put in here. Okay. Let's say you want a 50 ohm line, and that's typical for RF systems and GPS. So I would like to type in Z0, which is our characteristic impedance. And then I click on synthesize. And you can see we need about 0.35 millimeters to get a 50 ohm line based on this KiCad uh, calculator. Now, JLC PCB also has a calculator for their boards. And this is typically what I would go for because uh, to me, it's much quicker. So I go on JLC PCB impedance calculator. I type in that I want a 50 ohm line a four layer board with 1.6 millimeters. It's on an outer layer because it's micro strip and it's single ended. Click on this little arrow and I can see 11.55 mil is the recommended trace width. And let's just convert that to millimeters. And that happens to be about 0 0.29, 0 0.3 millimeters. So you can see there's a slight discrepancy between the JLC PCB calculator and the KiCad one. They have, various different calculators have different methods of solving these equations and solving for the characteristic impedance. But as long as you're on the right ballpark, you'll typically be fine. So something around 0.3 millimeters. Now going back to the Open Seneca board and looking at the RF section again, my main RF trace over here, you can see the width of that trace, if you look down here, is 0.293 millimeters or about 0.3 millimeters. And that's what we calculated using the JLC PCB impedance calculator. The next topic is that of when you have a controlled impedance trace, such as this thin 0.3 millimeter trace over here, and that then of course sometimes has to go into component pads. For example, this rather large pad of this UFL connector, or even this 0402 um, inductor over here. You can see there's quite a little jump from this trace to the pad, or from this trace to this pad of this connector. And the question is, does that matter? because this will have a different impedance to this trace and this will have a different impedance to this trace. Now I attended a Rick Hartley seminar or a webinar rather, where he talked about RF design and I asked him exactly that question, like do we actually need to take that into account? And his answer was no, we don't in pretty much most scenarios, especially low frequency situations like this. The impedance discontinuities are so small and the critical lengths that are involved are so small, so this is fine. If you're not happy with this answer, one way you can maybe mitigate the effects of having these impedance discontinuities in these large steps and jumps is something I've done here. So instead of having a jump straight from the pad down to this trace, I could start off with a slightly larger trace, take it from the pad and move it in into the trace. And this way we have a jump here, but a rather smooth transition to the next trace. And of course you can stagger these transitions. So I could start with a larger trace and then this is a bit of an extreme example, but then essentially carry it out like this. And this way you have a, a more gradual, smooth transition into these controlled impedance traces. But in general, according to Rick Hartley and in, according to the experiences I've had, you don't really need to worry about it, at least at these frequencies. But try to keep your pads relatively small or rather similar sized uh, relative to your controlled impedance traces. Now, of course, if you're routing on a two layer board, your traces will be much wider and then it will accommodate these larger pads. So there's a bit of a trade off there. A very important point when it comes to routing in general and also for RF designs is that of clearance and spacing. And you can see in this board here, I've tried to keep the RF section far away from the digital circuitry or any other Bluetooth or wireless modules. And just to give, make sure, give it enough physical space so these circuits don't interfere with each other. In particular, that nothing interferes with this 
very sensitive GPS section over here. Now the power section might be a, a bit close, but I've tried to place the inductors, which could radiate uh, more magnetic field lines, further away from this antenna section. So I try to keep space between the RF section, digital sections, analog sections, so on. And that's generally a very important rule in PCB design. And finally, let's briefly talk about bias T's. So typically we'll have an active antenna with a GPS module to improve reception, and an active antenna is basically a passive antenna, which includes some sort of filter and a low noise amplifier. And this low noise amplifier and this filter, or primarily the low noise amplifier, needs to have some sort of power applied to it in the form of DC. And typically we want to superimpose the DC on the RF signal, and the way we do that is via a bias T. A bias T essentially we take a DC signal, pass it through an inductor, which effectively ideally should block RF, and then we add that together, so to speak, with the AC RF signal, which is passed through this capacitor, which blocks DC but lets AC through. And the sum of these two signals is then passed to um, the antenna. So the antenna can receive the RF, but it can also be powered by DC. Now the inductor makes sure that no RF signal goes back into the power supply, but it lets DC through, and the capacitor makes sure that no DC signal is passed into the RF receiver front end. But of course, that the RF signal can pass through at AC frequencies. And the question is, how do we calculate the values for the inductor and for the capacitor? Now, this question, unfortunately, isn't quite as straightforward as I would have hoped. There's three ways of going about this. Firstly, it's simulation, and this is probably the best way of doing it, but that involves rather expensive RF simulation software, so maybe we'll pass on that for now. Secondly, the best option is the data sheet. The data sheet for a GPS module will typically tell you the values, and I'll show you in a second that it did in my case, of what values of L and C and so forth to use. If you don't have any of, these, of this information, you can use a rule of thumb, and I'll quickly show you how to do that now. So here's the rule of thumb. For a given characteristic impedance Z0, so for our system that will be 50 ohms, and a frequency of interest F, which will be about 1.575 gigahertz for the GPS L1 band, we need to make sure we do two things. First of all, we make, need to make the reactance, or rather the AC uh, resistance of the inductor, much bigger than these 50 ohms at the frequency of interest. So to make sure that at that frequency, the inductor behaves as an open circuit. The other thing we need to think of is the capacitor. And we want to make that reactance of the capacitor, or rather the AC resistance, much smaller than that impedance at the frequency of interest. And that makes sure all of the AC signal is passed through the capacitor with minimum loss. Now remember, this is just a rule of thumb, and in more sensitive systems, you need to really take care of impedance matching and so forth. But for simple systems like these consumer GPS modules, this is more than fine. Here's one of the GPS modules I used, and also the one I used on this Open Seneca board. It's fairly inexpensive, and GLC PCB has it in stock for only a couple of dollars. And if I click on the datasheet and scroll down a bit, you can see there's some typical application circuits, and this includes part of the bias T. So you can either have it with a passive antenna and an extra low noise amplifier, or in my case, we have an active antenna and we have a really simple bias network. You can see here, they give you the value for an inductor, but they're not showing a capacitor. This is because the capacitor is actually included in the module, and sometimes this is the case, sometimes it isn't. But the best thing is to always check the data sheet to make sure they might give you the values for LNC. And it did in this case, and that's exactly what I did then in this board. Essentially, I only have, I copied the circuit, and took this inductor value of 47 nanohenries, and the circuit works completely fine. 